Hi everybody, welcome back to Multimediale Werkzeuge, this time about image objects and color and psycho optics. So an example where image processing is used is, um, for instance, um, the editing programs Adobe Photoshop or GIMP, which is open source. There we can save images in different formats. Um, images and um, also um, edit them for instance add blur or sharpen and so on so I can show you a little example here so we take this image and open with GIMP GNU image manipulation program so here it opens and here you can see this image and then you ha um, have many tools to choose from so here and here so it's actually quite powerful and uh, it allows us to change and improve the image and then also export it in different formats so here when you say save as for instance then um, you can choose different formats here and uh, you can also say export export as and then you can export in different formats like let's see jpeg for instance so you can say jpeg and um, in jpeg you you can also um, cancel but we don't So you can set the quality. So here you have a quality factor which determines how much compression you can apply, right? This number. So 100 means full quality, and then you can go down to say quality factor 50, and then you have a much reduced quality. You can also show a preview here, and so you can go even further down to 30 quality factor of 30 and then you click uh, you also have advanced options here um, so for instance here we have um, the color subsampling factor that we can choose from so 4 to 0, uh, zero is, is kind of common and then we can say export so if you have 402 that means we have a downsampling factor of 2 horizontally and vertically by 422 we have it either either horizontally or just vertically and 444 we have no color downsampling which is um, actually overkill because our eye has fewer receptors for color than for um, um, brightness or luminance as we will see in a moment so 420 is actually a common um, downsampling scheme for color because the eye has less um, resolution for color horizontally and vertically. So that gives us good compression. At the same time, it sounds good. Uh, it looks good. Here we have a DCT method. So the DCT is part of the compression of JPEG, as we will also see in a moment so this allows us to uh, decompose this image into different spatial frequencies so those are frequencies not in time but these are frequency in space which means um, brightness or value fluctuations across the image so here in the image we can see we have fine detail so if you go across the line here then we have brightness changes up down up down and this can be um, computed as oscillations per degree. So if we have a certain distance to the image, then we can see it in a certain angle. Say this is one degree, then we can count how many brightness changes we have in this one degree. Um, usually we have a mix of brightness changes. So what we can see here in this image can be um, written as the sum of different cosine shaped uh, value changes 
uh, and this um, um, decomposition in those sines and cosines is done with a DCT. So the DCT takes a piece of the image um, and represents the brightness changes as a sum of cosine and uh, f, uh, of cosine functions horizontally and vertically. And since the eye has different sensitivities for different um, um, details, which means for different um, um, spatial frequencies, we can um, omit or more coarsely represent the fine details. So if I change a little bit of the tree branches here, nobody will notice. And this is what um, JPEG um, takes advantage of. So now we can export it. So now we have a much compressed image, hopefully. Let's take a look. So let's check the size here, properties. Here we have 1.6 megabytes. This is already JPEG compressed. So this is not the original uh, raw picture. And now compare it to the one that I just stored. So now you can see it's just 229. So it's a factor of roughly um, well, maybe five. So it's a lot of compression. Let's take a look. And it still looks good, right? So when you look at it, here in the sky, you can see now a few artificial boundaries, which were not there before. So this is a compression artifact. So here, those boundaries come because the brightness levels now become, uh, they get less or fewer bits than before. So when you compare it to um, the starting point, that was this one here, here you can see there are no artificial um, brightness boundaries. So this looks good here in the sky, but when you look at the now more compressed, you can see here those artificial edges. But other than that, it actually looks quite good. So you don't notice actually here in the trees that there are any changes. Um, you could see it by um, zooming in. So when you zoom in further and further, now you can see here this looks kind of funny. You can get the blocking artifacts and uh, um, those funny shapes here. So you can see here this uh, almost looks like a mosaic, those blo blocking artifacts. And when you compare it to the original, when you zoom in here, you see, you, you don't really have the blocking artifacts that much. So when you compare those two, here you get more blocking artifacts than you do here. But um, if you don't zoom in, you don't, don't really see it. So and that's the point, right? We actually changed the image, but in the way that it's not really obvious. And this is how lossy compression works. Right, so here we do have changes and when you look closely or when we zoom in, we can see the differences between the two, but just looking at it at a first glance, we don't see any difference. Right, and that's the point of lossy compression, that we save bits um, at information of the image that the eye also doesn't really see so well. So that's the principle that is used for lossy compression. So let me close those two again. Okay, I keep that open for later here. So yeah, this shows you how you can use those uh, compression formats, those lossy compression formats. Um, GIMP has a few to choose from and uh, JPEG with this quality factor shows you that you actually can choose between different compression um, uh, strengths using the quality factor. Yeah, so to start with, we have a picture which consists of pixels, right? So we have pixel graphics, also called raster graphics, and you can um, uh, store images more or less uncompressed um, using those um, raster graphics formats like BMP, bitmap, or TIFF for tagged image file format includes raster graphics, but also more. 
or raw, which is uh, just a poor pixel, pure pixel data. So if you have um, high-end uh, cameras, for instance, they often give you the choice to also store the raw format, which is useful if you uh, want to do post-process post of post-processing of the image. For instance, um, zoom in a lot. Um, uh, so then uh, when you have um, the JPEG format and you zoom in a lot, you saw that you might get uh, those blocking artifacts. If you have raw, then you don't have it. Also in raw, often the pixel values are stored with more bits than in JPEG. So this is useful, for instance, if you have dark pieces of the image uh, where you want to make um, them look more bright, then it's useful to have more pixels because that gives you more resolution of the values of the brightness. Yeah, so how is an image represented in this Vestro graphics? Well, the image first is sampled at the image dots, and that's what we call pixels or picture elements, right? Each pixel each image bec uh, consists of many pixels. So in the example that we just saw, this one here, let's see how many pixels do we have. So again, we see it when we do right click properties. So then we can click on image and here you can see it. We have a width of 3072 pixels and a height of 2304 pixels. So that makes a total of about seven megapixels roughly. Right. So we have an image and this image consists of roughly seven million pixels. Yeah, so if we just would have a black and white image or monochrome, then for each pixel, we just have a brightness value, which we also call the luminance. And this is usually represented with eight bits. And this results in 256 brightness steps. And usually 100 steps are enough for the human eye. So if you have from dark to bright, um, you have 100 steps, then we are fine. But um, imagine you have like dark parts of the image or the image is um, um, taken um, too dark, then you want to uh, multiply the value range. And um, then um, you have, for instance, only the lower four of the eight bits are used because it's not bright enough. Then you have um, much fewer steps. So that's why it's uh, sometimes useful to have more than those eight bits um, to be able to um, get a final resolution at dark parts of the image. So that's uh, good to have a few more bits um, than absolutely necessary because the range of uh, the exposure might be not the full range of um, your bits. Yeah, so take this example of a black and white image and imagine we have just one megapixel resolution so that's not state of the art, but just assume this for the sake of this example. Then this results in this memory requirement. So we have 1 million pixels, so 10 to the power of 6 pixels, times 8 bits. This is 8 times 10 to the 6 bit, or 1 megapixel, uh, 1 megabyte. So 10 to the 6 bytes, right? So we have one megabyte just for this black and white one megapixel image. So that's, that's already a lot. So now imagine we have color and for color, we have three primary colors for each pixel, red, green, and blue. So here, this is for each pixel. And that means we have three times that many bits or bytes. So now we have three megabytes for just one megapixel. And that shows that compression is desirable, right? So otherwise we have very large files. Yeah, so what are common formats? For instance, BMP for bitmap from Microsoft. It defines different color depth, 18, 14, 8, 16, 24, or 34. 
32 bits per pixel. Um, so you can define different qualities. And it also provides a simple lossless compression, uh, which is the run length coding. So it's really simple. It is basically um, if the same value often occurs often in a row or often occurs in a row, as with uh, flat surfaces in the image, the value is transmitted only once along with a number of repetitions. So here's an example. We have a row and these are brightness values, just as an example, one, two, three, four, and then you have five times the eight and then three, two. So as um, pixels, you could just repeat the value of eight eight times, but you could also just um, have a escape code telling the receiver that this is now the number of repetition. So we have a repetition of five times and this is the value that you want to repeat. So we repeat the value eight uh, five times. And this is called the run length code, right? So the run length code saves more the longer the sequence of um, symbols or values is. It's very efficient, for instance, for fax documents. Um, it's usually text. So we have, for instance, large fonts and a lot of white background. So the background value repeats a lot. And this can be efficiently encoded by run length coding. So this is a form of redundancy reduction, which uses properties of the source, which is our image. This is also a form of lossless coding, where no knowledge of the receiver in this KVI, in this case the eye, is necessary. So we can ignore that um, um, the human eye is the receiver for this case. So that's convenient but lossless coding only achieves a limited compression. We can get significantly higher compression using lossy coding. So using lossy coding. But for this, knowledge of the signal processing in the eye psycho optics is necessary. Right, so we need to know what's important for the eye and which is not. And this leads to the irrelevance reduction. Right. So this is the other principle. This is basically the removal of information which the eye cannot perceive. For instance, fine detail like the branches, the small branches in the trees that we just saw. Um, the eye cannot really distinguish is the, if a tiny branch is there or at a different place. Yeah, so this is the irrelevance reduction. So uh, we can see the differences if we zoom in, but not if we, if we don't zoom in. Yeah, so the first important principle is color. So color and light are electromagnetic waves of a certain wavelength range, which you can see here. So here you can see the entire wavelength, wavelength range from uh, radio over TV. So this is what's used for radio, for instance, FM radio. Here we have terrestrial TV. Usually it's already um, digital, but uh, broadcast on the same uh, bands as uh, the analog TV before. This is the VHF and UHF uh, range. VHF is now also used for digital radio, DAB+. Plus. Then above that, we have radar and wireless networks and microwaves. So microwave ovens, actually, they work in the same frequency range as wireless um, networks. And that's why microwave ovens can actually um, interfere with uh, wireless networks. But microwave ovens have much more power, so that's why they are shielded. Um, and this also shows you that microwaves are basically just um, infrared, uh, which is um, uh, basically uh, warmth, uh, what we feel as warmth. So if we hold our 
hand close to a, a heat radiator, what we feel there is basically um, the infrared radiation from it. And microwaves have a power of um, um, several hundred watts um, of uh, radiation, so usually something like 800 watts. But uh, our wireless networks only have um, usually about 0 0.1 watts, so a tenth of a watt. So you can see that a microwave oven has um, about 10,000 10, times more power than our uh, uh, wireless router. And that's why we don't feel any, any warmth from the router because it's so little power. Yeah, and that's why the microwave oven needs to be shielded because of the power. And we don't want to interfere with um, our wireless networks and also we don't want to heat anything outside. Yeah, and then when we go up here in the wavelength um, below one micrometer, we have visible light. So first we have um, the near infrared. This would be the far infrared. Here we have the near infrared at the visible light. And this is uh, what the eye can see. So you can see. So here this is in 10 to the nine, uh, minus 9 meters, so nanometers. So 1000 nanometers would be one micrometer meter. So 1000 times 10 to the minus nine is 10 to the minus six. And 10 to the minus six is one micrometer. So here you can see it. The shorter wavelengths here appear as blue and violet at this low end here. And the longer wavelength, almost a factor to longer, appear as red and dark red. So this is, this is basically all that our eyes can see, this um, very narrow range, roughly a factor of two in wavelength. Yeah, so I have this from this book here, this picture. And if light is reflected at surfaces, it interacts with molecules there. And um, resonances of um, molecules there absorb the corresponding wavelength and that makes it appear uh, as having a color. Makes the surface appear to have a color. So this is what's happening if you paint a wall, for instance. Uh, if you paint a wall, you basically um, attach certain molecules to the surface and those molecules absorb certain wavelengths of the light from the sun or from whatever and that makes it to appear to have the color. So the reflected light has a different spectrum and that um, makes the eye and the brain interpret as having a different color. Yeah, so the sunlight the white light here consists of a mix of many wavelengths. So it's basically a more or less flat spectrum. So when you look at the spectrum, the electromagnetic wavelength spectrum of the sun and the range of the visible light, it's, um, yeah, it's not exactly flat, but it's continuous, right? And when you um, send this uh, white light through a prism, then out comes um, different wavelengths at different angles. So then you basically can see um, uh, the individual colors um, or the individual wavelength of which this uh, white light consists. So here you have the longer wavelength. This is um, diffracted least. And then we have a shorter wavelength, which is diffracted more. So here on the lower end, we get um, blue and violet. And at the upper end, we get the long wavelength. Yeah, so that means the eye can distinguish light of different wavelengths as colors. So physically, these are just different wavelengths of the light. But our brain um, gives them impressions of different lights, uh, different colors. Yeah, and here this shows this diagram shows um, the spectral light sensitivity of our eye, and we can distinguish between daylight and night vision. 
So here you can see the different sensitivity curves. So red is for daylight vision and blue is for night vision. And you can see for night vision, um, the sensitivity curve is shifted a little bit towards shorter wavelengths, which you cannot really see here because it was hidden here. Okay, so this is better. Okay, so now here you can see the corresponding wavelength. So here again we start at 700 nanometers and go up to 380. And this is where the sensitivity curve of the eye stops roughly. And here's the um, color impression that we get. And we get those different curves because we have different types of light sensitive sensors on the retina of the eye. So here for Light, uh, for daylight vision, we have the cones, which can also distinguish between different wavelengths and give us the color impression. And for night, we have the rods, um, which are not color sensitive, just for, they are sensitive for light in general. And they have a slightly different sensitivity curve, as you can see here. Yeah, and they have the different sensitivities because, um, you know, maybe I should shift this down here. Shift this down. Huh. It's mixing up the graphs again. Interesting. Okay, so here we have the night vision of the rods is similar to the light spectrum of the moon and the, for the day vision on um, the cones um, have a sensitivity spectrum which is similar to the spectrum of the sun. So in that sense they act somewhat like a matched filter. So matched filter is a concept from communications and you have matched filters to maximize the signal to noise ratio and this is basically what the eye is doing for light. So it basically maxes, maximizes the sensitivity of our eye for daylight and um, night light or the signal to noise ratio. Yeah, and here you can see the cones um, for daylight. There we have three types, one for each primary color. Um, and here you can see uh, the sensitivity curves. So again here you have the longest wavelengths at 700 nanometers. Then you have the sensitivity curve for the cones for um, the red um, range of the spectrum and you can see here actually it has a second a smaller peak in the range of the blue cones. And this second um, peak here is important to distinguish between blue and violet because in this way since green is not active here at all here we can distinguish between wavelengths at the top of the blue cones and here further down so this allows us to distinguish between blue and violet so the second peak here otherwise we couldn't distinguish between blue and more blue and the uh, relative output of these three types of cones is used by the brain to um, um, make the impression of different colors. For instance, here this mix between red and green gives us the impression of yellow or blue-green. So this is important to distinguish more colors. So the same here with the second peak here for the blue it gives us uh, the impression of more colors. Yeah, and um, to um, be able to sort out those different color impressions, um, um, people made um, this um, color triangle, this color chart, which you can see here. So this is the color triangle, the color chart, standard color chart, where you can see those two axes as um, a theoretical output for the green cones. So the x-axis would be the theoretical output of the, green, of the red cones. This would be red. And vertical 
would be the output of the green cones. Right, and um, the difference of the sum of those two to one would be the output of the blue cones. And this chart is made such that the sum of all those three cone outputs is normalized to be one. And this is why you only get different colors but not different brightness. So basically the brightness here is normalized to one uh, by assuming that the sum of those three outputs sum up to one. And then we just have different color types. And on the boundary of this triangle here, this red line, is uh, what you get when you have a pure spectral um, frequency or wavelength. So this is, for instance, coming from a laser light. Laser only emits light of a given wavelength and not a mix. And this is the colors that this laser light would produce at the boundary here. So this would be the pure color at the boundary. And everything inside would be a mix of wavelengths. So it's not just a pure wavelength, but can only be obtained by a non-peaky spectrum. So here we would have a peak, just a single peak in the spectrum. Inside we would have a non-peaky spectrum, which is a mix of different wavelengths. Yeah. Um, so here you can also see when we increase the wavelength from green to blue to violet, then all of a sudden we also we get again get an output from the red cone. So here when we reduce the wavelength, first we have a full output for red. Then if, if we reduce the wavelength, we get less and less output from the red cones. So this output decreases as we reduce um, the, um, the wavelength until we hit the minimum here at about 500 nanometers we get the minimum of the output of the red cone and then we, if you further reduce actually here we get 500 so if you further reduce the wavelength below 500 then we actually have an increased output again of the red cone so as you can see here and if you get to 380 nanometers um, you get again a peak here of the red cone. So you can see the picture that we just saw um, is not really up to scale because here it shows that this peak already ends at 400 nanometer, which is not the case, right? So this picture is more like qualitatively, but not up to scale. So this is more precise, this picture here. So then you can also see the so-called black body curve this red line here and this is corresponding to uh, the wavelength m wavelength mix that a hot body emits so if you have like a hot iron like a iron ball or iron um, um, knife and uh, we heat it up a lot to a thousand or two thousand degrees kelvin um, then it glows and the color of the glow can be seen here so here you can see 2000, this is 2000 Kelvin, which is practically or roughly identical to 2000 uh, Celsius. And then we get this orange glow. If we heat it up more, we cannot heat up iron more because then it would evaporate at some point. But uh, if you would, uh, then at about um, 6000 Kelvin, it would glow with a white light. And we see this glow as white light because that's, the, uh, that's roughly the temperature at the surface of the sun. So the sun actually emits light which corresponds to a body of this um, heat. So basically we see the sun glowing white. And this is actually why our um, eyes um, developed to see this type of light as white because um, it adapted to the sunlight. If we heat up this body even more, then it becomes more bluish. Yeah, and this is also interesting for producing light because when we have uh, filament lamps, um, then we have this little filament which is uh, um, metal, which is made of metal, titanium and such, which is very heat resistant. So we can heat it up to about 2000 Kelvin without it melting away. It just evaporates slowly over time, so that's why it usually only lasts about a thousand hours and then it burns through. 
And this is also why we cannot heat it up more, say 3000 Kelvin, because then the lifetime of this filament lamp would be reduced drastically. So that's why we are limited by filament lamps to this region here. This is more like orange um, light. And this is different for LED lamps. LED lamps, they don't glow. They produce the light by exciting electrons in the atomic grid of semiconductors. And by the composition of the semiconductors, we can actually design the type of light it emits. So we can actually let it emit in this wide range. So using LEDs, um, actually we can produce daylight light. And this is um, and a big advantage, for instance, for studios, TV studios, or film productions, and also workplaces, because daylight um, gives the, the eye the um, impression or the signal that it's now daylight uh, and to be awake. And usually in, at nighttime, when the sun goes down, it becomes also more reddish, and that's for the brain then the signal to um, become tired. So um, in the morning, this um, filament light would be bad. In the morning, we should have this daylight. And in the evening, when we come home, we want to have this um, more um, orangey uh, tint. And that is why also LED lamps are available in different color temperatures. Um, when you buy them, you can see it. Usually they are on the range like, um, like between 2000 and 3000 in this range. Uh, so that's usually good for evening to make you more sleepy. But then there are others um, who are like in the range of 5,000 or 6,000. And this is good for uh, daytime um, to make you more alert. Right. Um, so recently you see fewer of those, which I find a pity because it's good to become awake. Yeah. And for some reason, this is called cold white. And that's actually a misnomer because it's actually even hotter. And maybe because of this cold white, um, this is uh, giving people a wrong impression and that's why they shy away sometimes from it. Yeah, so this show, shows you how you can use this diagram to mix colors. So when we have a color mix, like in displays, um, then you have additive color mixing. So on the display, you have three primary colors. For instance, here depicting with those crosses, X. So we have A, B, and C. And um, using those primary colors and different intensities for um, shining those primary colors from your display, we get different color mixes. And if we just mix two colors, say A and B, and have different brightness for those components, we get all the color mixes which are on the line between those two. So this is the weighted average between the two. So if um, both are equally bright, then we are right in the middle. So this would be B, B plus A divided by two, so exactly the average. So here B and A would consist of the two coordinates on this diagram. So here we have a coordinate x equals 0.5 roughly for this color a and also 0.5 roughly for y so x and y so b and a each consist of two coordinates similar here for b we have a um, little more than 0.2 for the x-axis and about 0.1 for the y-axis and by computing the average of the two we get the coordinates of the middle of the two. So it's a little bit shifted here. It should be right in the middle. Right. So in the center is again the white point. And um, we also have the concept of comp complementary colors. And complementary colors are defined such that the mix of the color and its complementary color always resu results in white or gray non-color. So if you have color B and this is color white, then we basically have to continue the same distance to get to the complementary color of B, such that we mix the two, we get to the white point, which you can see here. 
So this is the complementary part color of B. So here we have B blue, and the complementary color here would be this kind of yellow. It's not drawn to scale again, it should be the same distance to both. Yeah, and here you can see if you mix three colors, A, B, and C, we can basically get all the colors within this triangle. You see, when we mix those two, we get all the colors on the connection between the two. If you mix those two, we get the connection on this um, axis uh, or this edge. Or if you mix those two, we get all the colors on, on this edge. And if you mix all three, we get also you know, the interior colors here. So, for instance, if you mix those three primary colors uh, in roughly the same proportion, then we get the white point here. But we will never get any color outside this triangle because that would mean that um, uh, we would need, uh, would need negative components and we don't have negative um, mixture components. So this shows the limitation of displays, right? So if we know the primary colors of a display, say A, B, and C, then we know this display can only produce the colors within this triangle and not outside. For instance, in this case, the, the saturated green would be missing or the saturated blue or the saturated red. Okay. Yeah, so this can be seen here. So this actually shows examples of some displays. So here you have two different displays and each has a different color space depending on the primary color. And this is also where um, LED displays have an advantage because there you don't rely on a certain hue of a cathode ray tube to emit a certain light, but you can more finely design points which are closer to the top. So LED, uh, LEDs have more design freedoms and that allows you to display um, in bigger color space. Okay, so um, now to the spatial frequencies, which is also part of psycho um, optics and also filtering and color transforms. So the eye has two types of photoreceptors, as we saw, rods and cones. And when we, uh, when we estimate the number, we get about 110 million rods for light dark vision, so the luminance, also called scotopic vision, but only approximately 6 million cones, and they are concentrated in the so-called yellow spot, macula lutea, uh, which is for color vision in the daylight, the photoptic photo vision. So notice the big difference. So we have many more rods than cones. So it's about 20 times as many rods as cones. Big difference. So our eye has a very high resolution for brightness, the luminance, but much reduced resolution for color. And this is what we can now take advantage of in compression. Yeah, so this, this difference is important for transmission and compression. You can also read more on this Wikipedia page. Yeah, so also when you look at the optic nerve that um, goes to the brain, that only contains about 1 million nerve fibers. So again, a strong reduction. That means not every nerve has a connection to the brain, but they are somehow connected and compressed. So that means some filtering and compression must already happen in the retina. So you can also see more in this Wikipedia page. So what's going on there? So first, um, there is this um, very basic uh, law, which is called Weber-Fechner law. And um, yeah, it says um, how to deal with intensity gradations of sensory perception. So sensory perceptions like brightness of light or volume of sound is not arbitrarily precise. So it's basically like a quantization which is going on, except that it's um, not really a quantization, but uh, gradual changes which are perceived or not. So for this, uh, to see how finely uh, people can distinguish different 
perceptions, uh, we can do a test with subjects, with human subjects. So we ask then, what increase in a physical quantity, delta W, so W is the physical quantity, say brightness or loudness, and then uh, we change it a little bit, and we call this change delta W. So what corresponds to a constant increase in sensory perception? So we have the absolute physical quality W, and the result is for the sensation of the constant increase, uh, which means addition of a constant to a perception, this delta W must be proportional to W, which means delta W divided by W is a constant. Right, so this is a constant factor. So that means the multiplication of the physical value by a constant, this constant factor, results in the perception of a constant addition. Right, so that's, um, that's basically uh, this law, this Weber's law. So our sensory cells have a transfer function that converts the multiplication into an addition. And this is um, basically like a logarithm, right? So when you look at the logarithm, if you multiply two numbers, then the log of those two numbers is um, the, the addition of the logs of the two numbers, right? which you can see here. So the log of x times k is log x plus log k. So we turn a multiplication into an addition. So that means we can conclude that our sensory cells have kind of a log-like characteristic. And this is also one of the reasons um, that we have the decibel, for instance, for loudness, um, and why it uses a log function. Because that's basically similar to what our sensors are doing. So in this case, it mimics the behavior of our sensors, in this case, in the ear. So the decibel is defined as 10 times log x, if x is a power, or 20 times log x, if x is a voltage or current. So why is this log characteristic important for the senses? Well, this gives you an example. Assume we have a physical intensity range of 1 to 1000. Now we can apply log 10 function to this range, then it goes from 0 to 3. Right? Remember, log 10 of 1000 is just 3 because that's the power of 10. So then we see that it maps the range of 1 to 2000 to the range of 0 to 3. So it's a much reduced range. So this is uh, important to be able to reduce a wide value range of physical quantities to a small value range for nerve fibers. They usually have a value range on the order of just 4 bits. So, um, 16, right? So, these uh, nerve fibers that go to the brain um, don't have uh, such a large value range that they can transmit. So, that's why it's important to compress the value range. Yeah, additionally, we also have some sort of gain control, which is a slow adjustment, for instance, of the eye to the darkness. Um, which also uh, is, is helping with those uh, with this um, range compression. So here's an example of this log-like curve. So the log goes to minus infinity, which our compression in the senses are not. So actually here it goes to some limit. Uh, this is the limit of um, sensitivity or the threshold of sensitivity for our senses. And then it goes up and here it behaves at the higher values, behaves more like a log. Yeah, and this is, um, this is also behavior which is mimicked, for instance, uh, for logarithmic PCM, right? For pulse code modulation or short PCM. So this is pulse code modulation. So this is what we call PCM. For instance, the so-called Mueller PCM that are basically applies a curve like this. Yeah, then let's take a look at what the eye is to doing. So back to the eye.
So here we have our rods or cones, our photoreceptors. And then what follows on the retina is this log-like function. Right? And this is responsible for Weber's law. And then what follows next is those um, outputs are connected uh, via weights to a nerve fiber going to the brain. So this nerve fiber is going to the brain now. And it actually collects the information of several photoreceptors, rods and cones, using this, these weights. Right? And these weights, they vary. As you can see here on the right side, on this on diagram on the right. So here in the middle, you have the center um, photoreceptor. And that has the highest weight. So this is basically the receptor which is closest to this nerve fiber going to the brain. And then um, this um, nerve fiber going to the brain also branches out on the retina and collects the output of neighboring cells, photocells. But then it weights um, those outputs less. So you could think about those branching out nerves. They are more narrow, so they have a reduced weight. What's interesting is following next. So they branch out further and it's not only having a lower weight, but they are having a negative weight now. And this negative weight means if light falls on those sensors, then they actually inhibit any output going to the brain. So they reduce the output going to the brain of this nerve fiber. So it's uh, like negative light. And then if you continue, it goes up again. So this might um, remember you of the sync function, right? So it's basically like a sync function, these weights. And um, we know that a sync function in time or in the space domain, in the frequency domain, becomes a rectangular function. And this rectangular function is then a low-pass filter in the frequency domain. So basically what these weights are doing is uh, low-pass filtering in the space domain. So they, they do some low-pass filtering. And this low-pass filtering is important because, um, as we know from Nyquist theorem, if we want to do sampling, then we first have to do low-pass filtering. And here we do sampling because we have many fewer um, nerve fibers going to the brain than we actually have. Um, 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 uh, light sensitive um, cells on the retina. So we do uh, down sampling and before we do this down sampling we need to apply low pass filtering um, to avoid aliasing. And aliasing is also that something that the brain does not like because um, it um, gives it uh, false information. So that's why the retina contains a low pass filtering here in the forms of those weights. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by the way, an application of a logarithmic function in image post-processing is the application of a gamma correction, uh, um, and this dates back to analog TV times, but is also present in image processing tools like GIMP or Photoshop, and can be used to brighten up dark parts of an image. So I actually can show it to you um, in GIMP. Where's my GIMP? Here's my GIMP. So here we, again we have our image and then we can go to, um, let's see, where was it? Colors, Levels, right. And here this slider here is the gamma correction. So you can see if I slide down, it brightens up the dark parts here. Here we don't really have that much dark parts, but you can see the effect particularly here in the trees. If I go back to one, the original, so you can see the dark parts here in the trees really are dark and the sky is somewhat bright, not very bright. But when I go down to say 1.5, 1.6, the bright and the, the sky only becomes a little bit brighter, but then here the tree becomes a lot brighter. So now you can actually distinguish more of the branches. So this is actually when you have a lot of shadow, 
So here now in the in the trees, the branches, the dark branches now become visible. Right? And when I go back to zero to one, you can see here um, the undersides here became invisible, so it's just black. Right, going up again to 1.5. Now you can actually see structure here on the undersides. So this is an example of the logarithmic curve, and this is also something that appears quite natural to the eye. Right, when you look at this image, it looks really natural, and that's because um, that's what our brain knows. Right, our eyes are doing the same thing. They have this uh, logarithmic function. And here we just basically applied this logarithmic function to this image. And it still looks natural because that's what our brain basically expects. So it's actually, um, I find this a nice trick to um, correct images which were too dark inadvertently or mostly night images. So when you have nighttime, nighttime images, you often have um, some bright lights from street lights, for instances artificial lights, um, so they shine brightly, but then you also have a street on the streets, you have many sh shadows, uh, which are not reached by those street lamps. And they appear basically black when you take a photo, but if you uh, apply then the gamma correction, you can uh, nicely bright up those dark parts of the image. And then all of a sudden you can see details uh, in these parts of the image, which you couldn't see before. And it looks much more nice and more natural than um, the original. So, as a tip. Okay. So, this is quite a nice trick with a gamma. gamma. Okay, so back to the spatial frequencies. So, spatial frequencies, as I mentioned, are basically brightness oscillations. Um, oscillations um, per distance, for instance, brightness cycles per centimeter or per degree, and are important to understand the pre-processing in the retina. So the statement per degree is relevant for properties of the eye because that's an angle at a given viewing distance. And this basically de determines how this is projected onto the retina, right? And the retina is doing the process and processing, and that's why per degree is important. So imagine you have one row of the image and here from zero to one, this is one degree. And now you have brightness going up, brightness going down, and then it's going up again. So here you would have, would have one cycle of brightness per degree or one period per degree, right? And this is how you measure it. So keep in mind, this is really space and not time for the frequency. Right, so here you can see our weights on the retina again. And they also have an interesting effect if you have edges, right? So imagine now we have an edge in an image. So this edge is now projected on the retina. Here to the right, we have a higher brightness. To the left, now we have a smaller brightness. And since now this uh, negative weights get less brightness, they inhibit less. And that means the output becomes brighter, right? So now imagine we shift uh, this edge to the right-hand side, then uh, the main lobe, the main weights would get less bright, and then um, the negative weights here would get more light, and that means the output would be reduced, right? So that means we basically get larger brightness jumps when we have edges. So this can be seen here. So when we have edges to the to the left of um, this edge, basically here, when the uh, step comes from the right, then the negative weights get more light and we get a reduced output, which can be seen here. So when our um, receptive cells, um, this is basically, you know, I'm, so I should say, yeah, no, that's coming. So if this area, um, of increased brightness of less brightness is now um, affecting the negative weight, then we get more output. So in the vicinity of those edges, we get more contrast between darkest and brightest. So basically, those um, negative weights um, they um, have the effect of 
increasing step sizes. Right? So it's important for um, increasing or making um, edges more easily visible. So in this way, we get a spatial frequency filter. Yeah, so this comes from the so-called lateral inhibition of the retina. So that means that the lateral inputs uh, to our nerve fibers um, are inhibited, uh, inhibiting the output of this nerve fiber. So here, those negative weights inhibit the output, and this is called the lateral inhibition. So when we look at the retina as a surface, this is the surface of the retina. Here we have our optic nerve, and here we have the branching out to neighboring nerves, uh, light uh, cells. And here you have another nerve cell going to the brain, and you can see um, those areas which are called um, receptive fields. So let's see, right, so they are called receptive fields. So each circle is a receptive field and they overlap. So neighboring nerve cells have overlapping receptive fields and uh, the corresponding um, uh, photoreceptors might be connected to different uh, optic nerves um, with different weights. So here we have neighboring um, light receptive sensors and they are connected to different nerve fibers but with different weights. Yeah. And that's why we get this um, behavior of enhancing the visibility of edges. So you can see at each position of the retina, so again here, horizontally is the position on the retina. You can see the receptive fields, which are overlapping on the retina here. Again, dimension on the retina here. And this is then the output for the different nerve cells going to the brain. So depending on where this nerve cell ends on the retina, it gets this output. So here in the beginning, um, the output is all the same because the light is not changing. But then if, uh, if uh, the first um, receptive field hits this edge, then the output is reduced because what hits this edge this, with more brightness first is the negative weights, right? And that inhibits the output. So here, more and more light shines on the negative weights. And at this point here, the edge starts to hit the positive weights, and then the output increases more and more and more. And then we have basically covered the entire positive weights, and now we start the to hit the negative weights again. And then it goes down to the steady state for the brighter light. And this is how we get this increase of contrast for this edge. So our brain sees this edge with higher contrast, which helps the brain seeing um, contours. Yeah, and what happens here with those overlapping receptive fields is mathematically a convolution. So this is basically a local filter function of the, op the optic nerve weights with the brightness function of the light on the retina. So the output that we can see here so this output here is the convolution of this light function, this jump here, with the weight function of the receptive fields. So in this case, we will just take a cross section here as the weights. Then we have the sync function. So we convolve the sync function with the step function. And what we get then is this um, enhanced step. Yeah, so this uh, convolution is basically a filter. And we know a convolution in the space domain results in a multiplication uh, with a transfer function in the frequency domain. And the transfer function is basically the frequency domain version of our weights on the retina. So we can just take the, rate, the weights, apply the Fourier transform to it, and we get a transfer function in the frequency domain. And the result would be the so-called contrast sensitivity function, or CSF, of the eye. So this is the transfer function of the eye. And we can see it here. So here we see horizontally 
on the spatial frequency, Ohm's frequency means spatial frequency and periods per degree. It's on a logarithmic scale here. So here it's not a long linear but a logarithmic scale. And vertically is the sensitivity for this frequency. So higher sensitivity means there's less contrast necessary to see it. So when we go up, that means less contrast. And these lines, they are the threshold of visibility. So at this line is our sensitivity threshold. So that means anything below has more contrast and is visible. Anything above has less contrast and is invisible. So that means anything here above this curve here is invisible to the eye. And you can also see now there's a maximum. And here we have a maximum of this transfer function for bright light, which is around two cycles per degree. And for dark light, it's less. It's 0.7 periods per degree. And this also shows that it's not exactly a linear filter, it's a nonlinear filter because it depends on the brightness of the light. Yeah, and this curve was actually obtained by um, testing with te uh, test persons, right? And so it's, it's not like we know those weights. We obtained those uh, curves by using test images. Right. This can also be seen here in this little picture here. For some reason, the text is on top of it. I'm not really sure why. So um, this shows from left to right, higher and higher spatial frequencies. So here you can see slow brightness changes, gray, white, gray, black, white, black. And then it's faster and faster going between black and white until we have the highest frequency here on the right hand side. On the vertical axis, we have less and less contrast. So the contrast is the difference between the brightest and the darkest part of this oscillation. And you can see here when we go up, this oscillation between brightest and darkest becomes less and less. So here we have oscillation between gray and darker gray and becoming less and less. And at some point, we don't see anymore that there's changes between dark and bright because the eye cannot perceive it anymore. But remember, in reality, there's always some bright and dark changes, except maybe it's not um, displayed anymore. But at least in theory, there would be always black and bright changes. It's just that we don't see it anymore. And then there is a maximum that we can see, maybe around here, depending on how far away you are from your display and how large you display this um, image, your maximum changes in a certain range. So it actually has this change, uh, this shape that we can see here, right? This sensitivity curve, the contrast sensitivity. So this is then, um, and again, again, an important tool for compression because imagine you have to compress an image like this, um, then all this a the areas which appear gray to the eye just need to be transmitted as one gray value, which we just repeat, instead of a detailed resolution of those fine details. So like this area here in the beginning and here in the end, uh, we can um, encode as just gray because the eye doesn't see it anyway. We just have to know which is which, and that's why we need um, the frequency decomposition using the DCT, which we, which we will see later. Yeah. Right, so basically here we can see particularly the high frequencies are not seen by the eye. So anything above 50 is basically invisible. And also if you're below 50, like between 10 and 50 periods per degree, the eye is not very sensitive. We need to have um, a very high contrast for the eye uh, to be seen. Yeah, so the contrast sensitivity function of the eye shows that it has maximum sensitivity for low and medium spatial frequencies or patterns. Since the number enhanced the density of rods for brightness and cones for color, differ significantly, we get different contrast sensitivity function curves for brightness 
and color, right, which can be seen here. So here you can actually see two different curves. Again, we have the spatial frequency on the logarithmic curve. Here we have the relative contrast sensitivity vertically. So going up means less contrast. And here you can see two maxima. Here the circles. Um, this curve is for brightness. So this comes from the cones. And because we have many more cones, those cones can resolve finer patterns. And this curve is for brightness. And since we have, well, this is rods, right? So we have many more rods, and that's why we get a higher resolution for fine patterns. And we have much fewer cones, which means we get less resolution for fine patterns for color. Right, so here we have maybe 0.7, here about, I don't know, 2 or 3. And when you compute it, this difference of the maximum can actually be explained by the relative number or the relative density of the two. So we have 100 million rods, 6 million cones, roughly. And since they're on the surface, when we um, then measure it on um, just one dimension, we need to take the square root to get the density on, uh, say, one row of our image. And that gives us roughly a factor of four between the two. And this is what we see here. This is roughly a factor of four between the two. So it can be explained by the different densities. Yeah, the IOS only uh, also has a limited time resolution, which can be seen in this plot. So here we can see at around 10 hertz, we get a very obvious flicker. So the eye is very sensitive to 10 um, um, flickers per second. Um, so we, if you don't want to have flicker, don't, we don't want to go there. So if you want to avoid flicker, we need to go on the order of 50 or more hertz um, for um, uh, say a frame rate. Uh, if we display frames on our display and we want to um, avoid flickering, we need to be in this range of close to 100. And you can also see it differs between bright displays and not so bright displays. If it's not so bright, we need less. If it's bright, we need more. And that's why large computer displays um, really need um, high frame repetition rate. So usually they are 80 hertz and above, so that we are in this range. Yeah. So the critical flicker frequency is not constant, but rises or increases as brightness increases. Increases. This is also from the book uh, from Watkinson, the JPEG handbook. So again here, another plot which basically shows the same. The temporal resolution. So here, this is in dim light. So this is like an old TV in the evening where you don't have much light, then you may be happy with 20 hertz, right? But if you have a brighter display, like an LED display or a computer, a computer display, then you want to have at least uh, this 80 hertz here. So in bright light, yeah, and this is uh, this maximum close to um, 10 hertz. Yeah, and that's also why on, in, on TV we have a 25 hertz frame rate. Um, but we have a, uh, as picture frequency, but we have a 50 hertz or 60 hertz field frequency. And the field consists only of either the odd or the even rows. Um, to avoid this flickering, right? So also in analog TV, um, there's the desire to go to higher um, frequencies. In digital domain, this half frame and this, these fields or even or odd rows um, are not really necessary anymore because we have memory, and that's why we use the prog uh, we use the uh, progressive. Um, uh, so-called progressive scan, where we basically um, repeat uh, the entire image or have an entire image transmitted instead of um, just the even or odd rows. Right. Similar trick for cinema. In cinema, 
well, at least the old analog cinema where we had film, we had 24 um, pictures per second. That was usually not enough. So the trick there is to just repeat each image twice so that we get a um, frame rate of 48 um, hertz. Again, to avoid flicker. Yeah, then something interesting the eye is doing is the so-called saccades. Um, this is basically involuntary eye movement. And this helps uh, basically the scanning of objects or this perception of surfaces um, through um, involuntary eye movement. So if you have a fixed um, scenery and you would just stare on this fixed scenery without moving your eyes, then after a while everything disappears. So if you have, um, uh, if you can actually manage to uh, keep your eyes still for several seconds, after a while everything will appear gray. And you really have to concentrate on it because this is an involuntary eye movement. So these are small movements of your eye um, to avoid um, getting this impression that everything disappears. Yeah, and that's also part of active vision, that's scanning of the image with the eye, right? Basically, um, we just see a small part of the environment sharp and the rest is unsharp and that's why we scan it, right? The center is sharp vision, but um, to see more of the environment, the eye scans uh, the environment to, um, uh, to capture more of it. Yeah, so there's also filtering of the eye, basically, it highlights uh, light that changes, for instance, flashing light like those 10 hertz or moving objects. So basically it's made for moving objects or appearing objects. So you can think of um, um, evolutionary, this was very important. Um, for instance, if, if there was um, some animal appearing, then either it's, it's uh, good as food or it's dangerous and then you have to flee. But in any case, you have to do something. So it's important to, for the brain to capture anything that is moving. Yeah, and this is also hiding immobile objects on the retina, for instance, um, tiny um, cells or um, like there, there's um, tiny um, um, bacteria on, on the retina, which we don't really want to see, or uh, some blood cells, which we don't want to see, or also um, this um, um, blind spot on the eye. There's this blind spot where all the nerve fibers go into the brain. And at that point, there are no light sensitive um, cells. So basically, we have a hole in our um, retina but we don't see this hole because it's fixed and our brain basically gives us the impression uh, that there is no hole. Basically, it's not relevant for the brain. It basically fills um, this hole by information from the surrounding. And um, this uh, we need this hole because uh, it basically um, comes from the ev uh, evolutionary development of the eye. The eye developed as um, basically part of the brain and uh, um, the uh, nerve cells um, basically came out and came from uh, on from the top and then um, the uh, light sensitive uh, cells developed below it and that's kind of uh, it works because the light sensitive cells uh, nerve fibers are uh, tr somewhat transparent but it's still kind of a not optimal design a much better design for instance is what um, uh, squids have. And there are squids which have large eye and uh, they are very good and there the nerve cells come from behind and th they don't have a blind spot. And that's because there the eye is developed separately from the brain. So you could also say evolution found a local minima for our eyes. It's good enough but not perfect. Right? So yeah. Right, so it's it's not really intelligent design, but unintelligent design. It's basically part of evolution. Yeah, that's basically it for today. Thank you for your attention and then see you next time.